so so you may wish to to just um take a few minutes to just tell us yes. how that is affecting particularly um the, the messianic community yeah first of all i want to thank you uh, brenda for this opportunity to be with you uh, with all the brothers here sisters i see there are here so many god bless you <laughs> It's my pleasure to meet more brothers, more sisters in the Lord. And yeah, so my name is Roger Joaquim. I'm from Israel. I live in Haifa, on Mount Carmel. Uh, I serve in different sections in Tree of Life. One of them is uh, I'm at the prayer coordinator for Tree of Life. So uh, Brenda, uh, do you want me to talk about the ministry or about Israel first? Well, just talk about uh, Israel first, just for a few minutes, because uh, these dear ones want to pray uh, into it. Yes. Okay. And, yeah. uh, and then about the ministry in particular and how we can pray coming up to this Pesach. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, as you, you saw in news, we had so much troubles in Israel. We have a lot of troubles in the Knesset. We need that all the prime ministers inside the Knesset in that place where they take the decisions for the generations uh, in Israel, they put the law, they wanna change law. So one of the prime ministers lately, we saw that he tried to put um, a new law to stop evangelizing in the name of Yeshua, Jesus Christ. And he's like this prime minister, his, his dream to do that, it's more than maybe 15, 20 years. He dreams to do that in Israel. So yes, we see that God puts a seeds in people's hearts to fulfill the purposes through them. And yes, we see that the enemy, he tried to use people to put their seeds and to use them in the same time. But we love them all <laughs> and we forgive always. And we know the voice of Yeshua as the high priest in heaven. He wants everyone to be saved. So, and we see in Israel, in the Knesset, there is, we have the right side and we have the, the left side. It's a lot of division inside. And this division, it tries to divide the people in this land. So everyone, he has his own opinion, but both sides, they are not united. There's hatred. And we in Israel, we used to call it, there's a name, we, we call it free hatred. So yes, we need to stop against that and to prophesy that this free hatred, to turn to be free love, everlasting love, to know God, the, the veil to be raised from their eyes, to know Yeshua. And then the right side and the left side, they can combine together and love one each other in everlasting love. So we saw, uh, yeah, a lot of people going to the streets, they release their rage, they release their angry, a lot of anxiety at the same time. It's like, People don't feel in, the, in peace in their hearts. And you know, Israel is surrounded by so many countries around us. And the enemy, we know that he looks, is like on, like he's, he's watching what's going in this land. And I think he tries to see the weaknesses and when to hit and when to do terror and when to do different stuff like that. So in the same time, as the enemy watches, we have the watchers that stands on the walls of Jerusalem and they never been silent and they never let God to be silent. So we have higher authority. If they operate in second heaven, we operate from the third heaven <laughs> where we're seated with Christ. So we are above the enemy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, like I feel pain as someone lives in, in the land of Israel 
when we see the chaos in the Knesset, in this place where they take the decisions, when we see that chaos, it's coming to the church. And we see that there's a lot of chaos in the atmosphere. It's a lot of division, a lot of chaos. So I used to wake up at uh, five uh, at midnight and one of my prayers every day I speak order in the name of Jesus. And we declare peace in the name of Jesus and we unite the people. So this is our job to prophesy life, to prophesy peace and to bring order. And one of the things I would like all of you to pray for, it's for the church of Jesus Christ as Arabs, as Jews, as Americans in this land here serving, to pray for them to know the word ecclesia, not a congregation. It's the ecclesia that stands in the heavenlies and know how to take authority and to change nations through the houses of prayer, through fast, through prayer, to wake up at midnight, to pray several times a day. It's like to raise up the Daniels in this land. Yeah, because every like every day, like we push with, with all the believers, all the saints in Israel and outside Israel, we are one body. Sometimes they, they ask me to, to like to which church you belong. I said to the church of Jesus Christ all around the globe. <laughs> I don't want to like put myself, give up myself a title, belong only to Israel. No, because I believe the breakthrough that our churches and congregation can have, is going to be your breakthrough immediately because we are one body. And your breakthrough is going to be our breakthrough. So... Yes, so this is one of the reasons we pray as one nation, one people united by Jesus Christ. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. It's dropped in people's hearts and we will pray. We've been talking a lot about the ecclesia or ecclesia and taking our authority. And we have a three-day fast coming up in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And a fast. And we will be standing and taking authority. And I've made a note of what you've said. So bless mm -hmm. you for that. So then um, if you can just tell us about a little bit about how we can pray for this ministry to, to yeah. bring Jesus to the Jews. Amen. So Tree of Life Ministries Israel, it's raised by Ariel and Sheila Hyde. Uh, Ariel is the son of Caroline Hyde, your friend Brenda. And I, I think that maybe all of you, uh, you know Caroline, just a precious woman of God. We love her so much. So this ministry is raised to bring the gospel first to the Jews in this land, second for Arabs and uh, all the people in this land. So we operate in the in all social media platforms. It's Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, um, uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, YouTube. So we do. We have our own content in Hebrew. At the same time, we translate them for people outside Israel also to watch the job and the work that we do in this land. So. Thanks God, we are blessed as channel, and we believe this is by your prayers from the nations. We are not blessed because we are blessed. No, we believe because we need more prayer. And I believe always I used to say that that prayer is the, the backbone of every ministry in the world. Yes. Intercession, it's the backbone that holds everything. So we believe we can't do that alone. So this ministry, we do uh, a content in Hebrew to open the, the Jewish eyes, the people in this land. In the same time, we do campaigns. And we believe as a, a ministry to walk as a new man in Israel because the Arab people in this land, they are 22% of the total number. So we believe that Arabs, according to the book of Romans 11, when Paul said that, God going to provoke the Jews' jealousy by the Gentiles. 
So I'm me specifically, I'm coming from Arabic background in Israel. And like I'm expert to provoke their jealousy, to be honest. <laughs> Dozens of Jews, they come to know Christ by me. It's so beautiful. <laughs> and it's specifically, it's more beautiful when we as people walk in the spirit, when we evangelize to the Jew and we begin to prophesy and we say, this is the word from God of Israel to your life, they begin to cry immediately. Because we have a lot of hatred in Israel between the Arabs and the Jews. It's the, you know, the Palestinian borders and inside Israel. But we pray, we know that a lot of people inside in the Muslim nation, they are victims for their cause. So this is how we walk, we operate. We go every time in campaigns, we call the Arabic churches to come to, 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 to go with us. And we, we, we give a, a free booklets, a free new tastement, old tastement, and we give them a card that they can just scan a code and to go for our website. And in the same time, we take their phone numbers and we pray with them on phone and we continue to teach because it's very hard for the Jewish people to take it easy because they are very brainwashed from childhood against Jesus Christ. They have so many seeds that you need to take. It's like in the book of Jeremiah chapter one. So God said, you need to pull down things and you need it to destroy. And then after that, you seed and you plant, you know. So this is not an easy job, to be honest. But we know and we see how the Holy Spirit works. I can tell you, from December, we had a Chag Chagim campaign. It's when people in Christmas, in this land, they come to our city, Haifa. It's down in, in Mount Carmel. We, we, we went so many uh, believers, Jews and Arabs together. And for the first time, I'm going to tell you, in Israel, we always seen people fighting with us, screaming on us, shouting on us. I'm going to tell you something. For the very first time in Israel, we saw 95% they are open to hear peacefully the gospel of Jesus Christ. Wow. Yeah. It's for the first time. I used to evangelize in Israel from 2009. And I can tell you, we had a lot of fights, <laughs> cursing us. <laughs> and sometimes they like unite by groups and they begin like to shout against us. And this is really the very time, first time we see this kind of opening. So I believe that Jesus Christ, when he went for the nation, is coming back <laughs> for the lost sheep of Israel. So yes, we need your prayers because tomorrow also we're going to release a new video. This video name is Who is Yeshua? It's 15 minutes. Uh, we take the shots and we film this video in Jerusalem. And we speak there about a lot of scriptures, a lot of prophecies about who is really Yeshua. And in the end, we offer a salvation prayer with people. So we felt from the Holy Spirit to release it tomorrow before the Passover, before Pesach. So because we know Pesach, it's Pasach, it's he passed. So we want to pray that the veil in this Passover to be revealed, to be, to lift it up, that they could see Yeshua. And we know that there is a beautiful promise that all Israel is going to be saved. How are a whole nation going to be like, like born again in one day? God can do it. <laughs> it's good with Nineveh. We did it in different places. <laughs> Ah, oh, that's wonderful. I mean, we're absolutely delighted to hear what's happening, and uh, we want to pray. We want to pray for you, but I think we'd like to have you back at some point to to yeah. share with us uh, to greater um, level. Um, I to also, Brenda. Yes, and we also uh, in those videos when we release them in the 
in, in social media platforms, uh, as I mentioned before, people used to make comments. So there is something in the algorithm in those social media. It's like the robot, the IT that works behind. When there is a lot of comments, it's the video begin to spread more in the land. So the more people like attack, the more it's being seen by people and goes wider. It's because <laughs> those platforms, they give a videos priority. They raise its a pro priority when there are people, a lot of people react. Yes. So we know that the haters or those, those who are against, they like help God at the same time. Yes, yeah. But it, it, it takes up. Uh, so then our, our team in the office, we begin to comment back and we begin to take those people one by one for phone calls. So this is what we do. And we have the hotline that people, they call. And they ask about Yeshua because we put the number of our hotline in for office. And at the same time, we have the pro-life section where we help people to cancel their abortion. Wonderful. Because, again, Brenda? I just said that's wonderful. Yeah. That's so, so we feel every day how our family has been attacked every day, specifically when we want to release something new, we want to work for a new project. We can see all other brothers, like I'm telling you, a massive spiritual attack like never before. And it, it, like, it's not you feel, you see it in the front of your eyes. So we need your prayers. We need we need people like to pray fervently with us, to have the to have a, a burn hearts to pray for Israel and for all the ministries. And we are not the only ministry who's doing that in Israel. There are so many also beautiful ministries. They are doing this beautiful job. Yeah. And it's not about us. It's about Jesus Christ. Of course. Oh, yeah. I think what I'm going to just do is are you, are you there, Andrew Bagley? I don't know if you're there or not. Yes, enjoying every minute. Yes, please, it's amazing. Praise the Lord. Yes, Hi, Roger. <laughs> Would you like to just pray for him before we, we um, it, maybe we, as I say, we can have you again, Roger, but we, and, um, mm -hmm. we're going to pray leading up to Pesach. And so this is a prayer. And then uh, we, we will turn um we will ask philip to um to share say we've got a double stereo <laughs> double anointing today um, <laughs> but that's been fantastic to hear uh, what's happening and uh, um dovetail shalom is a group raised up to intercede for israel and the destiny of Israel linked really with the destiny of Britain. So uh, if you'd like to just pray, Andrew, and would everybody like to just stretch out their hand toward Roger for protection, for wisdom, for his family. Um, and so we're all part of this prayer. You're not just listening, folks. Your heart is going out to to this man, this brother. I asked the Lord for a scripture before you started, and he gave me Isaiah 26, a couple of verses, and I'm reading these verses from the One New Man Bible. On that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. He will appoint salvation for walls and bulwarks. Open the gates. So the righteous people who are keeping faithfulness will enter because he trusts in you. You will keep in Shalom. Shalom, the one whose mind is close to and dependent upon you. Trust in the Lord forever. For everlasting strength is in the Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for your servant, Roger. We thank you for the testimony that he's brung. Lord, we thank you for what you've put in his heart, such a love for the people, Arab and Jew. Lord, we thank you for the ministry that he shares with others. 
and we pray anointing we pray increase we speak that over him and over his ministry we pray lord that even more amazing things will happen as he sees miracles at your hand working fulfilling your word of prophecy and promise lord that he and his family may know the blessing of god almighty and that they will know the presence of Yeshua HaMashiach every single hour of every day, for he alone is his Savior and Lord. Bless our brother Roger, we pray, in the mighty name of Yeshua Messiah. Amen. 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 I'm just going to say, Roger, before we turn to Philip, that we have prayer for Israel on Wednesday at um seven o'clock this coming wednesday not every wednesday this coming wednesday at seven o'clock and if you were free and you wanted to come on and lead us in that we'd be delighted uh, 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 and next uh, wednesday yes but we can talk about that again but it's just that um i feel that you've stirred no it's not next wednesday it's the 12th I feel that you've stirred hearts here and and um, it, it's very, very good to pray with the land as the one new man. Amen. And, and, I, uh, I think I can do it. Just let me check and I will text you back. Yeah, I will see. I, I, I would like to do that. <laughs> yeah, yes. Praise God. Wonderful. We thank thank you. you for our lovely brother. <laughs> so bless you we feel we've got a new friend so over to you philip and we thank you you're welcome to join us or we know it's shabbat and if you need to go we understand that roger so i'll stay as long as you're able because mm -hmm. this is a very precious brother philip um i, I love him a, a lot because i've I've had a lot of fellowship with you, Philip, and I appreciate what you carry. So we're looking forward to what you have to share. Thanks very much, Brenda. And thank you, Brother Roger, for what you brought to us. Uh, you will find that, it, if I may use the word, it dovetails quite nicely with what I'm intending to say. And that, could you give me the ability to share screen, please? Yeah. Uh, brothers and sisters, it is great to be with you. It's so nice to look at the screen in front of me and see a lot of old friends and a lot of familiar faces. So thank you for allowing me to come and be with you. When Brenda invited me to join you, she didn't give me a brief. She said, just speak about what's on your heart. And I thought that's really brave because you don't quite know what you're going to get. But what you are going to get is what's on my heart. And what I want to speak about is meeting your destiny or missing your destiny. Meeting your destiny, meeting our destiny or missing our destiny. And of course, there's a personal aspect to that. The scriptures tell us that God has prepared good works for us to do. That doesn't necessarily mean that we will do them. We have a choice about whether we step into that destiny that he has set for us. So there's that personal side to it. But what I want to do is look at it on a wider canvas. So I want to look at it in terms of the destiny of nations. Amen. And we know, and Roger has touched upon it, that the turmoil that we're seeing across the world, he called it chaos and confusion. This turmoil is increasing. And in recent weeks, we've nowhere seen it more strongly than in Israel herself. Yes. Israel, who is the bellwether of the church, who is the focal point of world history, who is the apple of God's eye through the, the lens through which God views the world in many ways. Israel has been in turmoil. There is a battle for the heart and soul of that nation but there's a battle for the heart and soul of every nation ours included these are days the days that we're in right now 
These are days when the destiny of nations will be decided. The question for us as a nation is, are we going to step into our God-given destiny or are we going to allow the enemy to pervert it or to deny it? That's the framework in which I'm coming at what I'm going to say. Now, a nation can only be as strong as the church in that nation. A nation can only give birth to the godly things that nation is pregnant with if the church acts as midwife. If the church doesn't do that, if the church isn't midwife to the things the nation is pregnant with, the God-given destiny of that nation is going to be stillborn. Now, you would not want to build a whole theology on the idea of the Hebrew midwives, Shifra and Pua, as types of the church. But in any case, it is legitimate to talk about the midwife role of the church. If the church is going to fulfill that midwife role, she has to understand what the nation's destiny is. How can you um, enable the church to give the nation to give birth to a destiny that you do not yourself understand? And you have to understand the times. You have to know where you are in God's prophetic timeline, where you are along the road of that destiny being fulfilled. So the church needs to stand against the ungodly commands of Pharaoh. Pharaoh who represents the state, Pharaoh who is an antichrist forerunner, Pharaoh whose word brings death, kill all the Hebrew boys. The church has to stand against that and speak life to a nation. That is part of our God-given task as the church in the nation that we have been set on. And if we're going to meet our destiny, we need to understand our context. So I want to explore a little bit context in terms of meeting our destiny and missing our destiny. I'm going to look first at some historical context because that helps us to understand the road that God has taken us on on what he's sown into us. It helps us see the intention of God's heart for a nation. And then I'm going to look at our present circumstances and where we are along that destiny road at the moment. And here's where I want to share some photographs with you by way of visual aid. Here's the first one. And I'm not sure how clearly this will come out. It's a very old photograph. Is taken from 1898. And here you can see a man on the back of a white horse. This man is Kaiser Wilhelm II, the German emperor. He's Kaiser Bill of First World War infamy. And this is a photograph of him in 1898, about to enter Jerusalem. Because in 1898, Kaiser Bill did a tour through the Near East. He went first to the Ottoman Empire, modern Turkey, if you like, plus all its colonies. And in the Ottoman Empire, he widened and deepened the relationship that Germany had been building for many years with the Ottomans, with the result that when the First World War came, Ottoman Turkey fought with Germany and Austria-Hungary against the Allies. From Ottoman Turkey, Wilhelm went on to Jerusalem, and here you can see he's beautifully kitted out. He looks just splendid on his horse. This is a picture of pride. As he was riding into Jerusalem, he had the Jaffa Gate partially demolished. The reason he did that was that as he rode in with his lovely plumed helmet, he didn't want to bow his head. That would have been an unbecoming, unfitting thing. For a German emperor to do. So he is a, a making a statement there of pride. But he is also coming in, I would suggest, as an antichrist type figure. The book of Revelation tells us about two individuals who ride a white horse. One of them in Revelation 19 is the Lord Jesus Christ himself on his 
side are written the words faithful and true. But there is another individual who rides in on a white horse, Re Revelation 6. This is a conqueror bent on conquest. And this again is the spirit in which Wilhelm comes into Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, or rather to take a step back, this is missing your destiny big time. Because in the 1840s, so about 50 years before this photograph was taken, Germany at that stage was divided. It hadn't yet been united into one uh, empire. And the main German kingdom at that time was Prussia. And Prussia and Britain were cooperating together in the 1840s to set up Christ Church Jerusalem, the first Protestant church in the land. They were working together because God's purposes for those nations were to work together for the benefit of the Jewish people and for God's purposes to restore Israel. That was the plan that God had for those nations. Now, Wilhelm is missing that plan. When he came riding into Jerusalem, also in that city at that time was Theodor Herzl, the man who founded Zionism. Herzl really wanted to speak to Wilhelm about his plans with bringing Jews back to the land because the German Reich had so many Jews within its border. I think at one point Herzl and Wilhelm did get to, to speak briefly, but nothing came of it. Again, a missing of destiny. And it was even worse than that because he didn't only miss his God-given destiny, he turned into a satanic destiny. After visiting Jerusalem on the same trip, Wilhelm went on to Damascus. And in Damascus, Wilhelm was a great fan of everything to do with chivalry. And he greatly admired Saladin, the Muslim hero of the Crusades, of the fight back against the Christian Crusaders. So he went to the tomb of Saladin in Damascus. It was very dilapidated at that time. Wilhelm paid to have it lavishly restored. But he stood beside the tomb of Saladin and he said that Germany, quote unquote, was a friend for all time to the Jewish, sorry, to the Muslim people. That is a statement of spiritual allegiance, which I believe has bound Germany ever since and is still on the nation today. You remember in the early uh, 1940s that the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Al Husseini, came to meet Hitler, to agree with Hitler in his plan to exterminate the Jews. Again, that link that had been made in Wilhelm's day between Germany and Islam was playing out. Recently, the former German Chancellor Angela Merkel opened the borders of her country to a mus million Muslim migrants. Again, that spiritual power is on Germany. Germany, through Wilhelm, missed her destiny. It's an absolute tragedy. Now here I'm going to share the next picture, or rather, if I can call it up properly, I will uh, share the next picture. This is about meeting your destiny. It's only 20 years or so after the picture I just showed you. This one is from 1917. And let me just pull that up on the screen. And you will see here, this is General Allenby the British general who liberated Jerusalem from the Ottoman Turks in 1917. And you see Allenby in contrast to Wilhelm is walking into the city. He walked into the city because unlike Wilhelm, he understood his context and understanding his context, he was able to meet his destiny. The reason he understood his context is that before Allenby left Britain to go to Egypt to take command of the empire forces there, it was called the Egyptian Expeditionary Forces. Before he did that, 
Allenby went to meet a friend of his who was a retired general. And that general had recently read a book from the 1880s called Light for the Last Days. It's written by a man called Dr. Henry Grattan Guinness. And it is the most extraordinary investigation of the prophecies in the book of Daniel. It's a book well worth reading even today. And if you look on the internet, you will find it freely available through archive.org. Also in a word searchable function, which makes it very helpful. A great book. And Grattan Guinness, looking at the prophecies of Daniel, had understood that 1917 was going to be a pivotal year for the Jewish people and specifically for Jerusalem. So Allenby goes to see his friend, this in circumstances where at that point, every British attempt to break out of Jerusalem and get into the Holy Land had been a failure. But Allenby's friend explained to him what the prophecies of Daniel said and therefore was able to assure him that Allenby's campaign was going to be a success. Allenby understood his concept. How amazing those things are. That's what it looks like when we understand our context. And so I just want to talk a little bit about our present day context and what that may mean in terms of praying for Israel and praying for our own nation. One of the best single sentence explanations of where we are on God's prophetic timeline I've ever heard comes from Derek Prince shortly before he died. He was visited by an American senator called Sam Brownback. And Brownback asked Prince what was going on in the world, to which Prince replied, God is restoring Israel and God is judging the nations. Well, on one level, you'd say, of course he is. We all know that the scriptures affirm it. But it is still good to be reminded that that is the overarching framework to everything that we're seeing and experiencing at this point in redemption history. As so often, of course, the devil is in the detail. So I'd suggest that we should do what God advised ancient Israel to do. In modern business, you'd call it conducting a 360 degree review. In Jeremiah 6.16, he calls it standing at the crossroads to look. What is God doing in Israel and the UK? How does that relate to the way that he's dealing with us in the past? Because the way he's dealing with us in the past tells us about where he wants to take us in the future. And if th this gives us an understanding of the environment that we're in and the purposes of God, what do we then need to do to align with those divine purposes? I'd suggest to you that these times we're in are characterized first and foremost by what to use a fancy Greek word you'd call a paradigm shift, a seasonal shift, and also by acceleration. The paradigm shift means that what might have been good enough years ago is no longer good enough. What might have been useful years ago is no longer fit for purpose in the present day. The old wineskins won't be able to receive the new wine. And the acceleration means that everything that we're seeing and experiencing is speeding up. So think about the situation in Israel. The Bible tells us that God is in the business of restoring Israel, restoring Jerusalem, and restoring Zion. In terms of restoring Israel, we saw a massive step forward in 1947, 1948, with the rebirth of the state of Israel. Restoring Israel is not complete, but a big step has been taken. Restoring Jerusalem, again, a big step forward in 1967 when the whole city came under Israeli control. 
not complete yet, but a big step taken. Restoring Zion. Well, we had a glimpse of that in 1967. There was a brief moment when the Israeli flag flew over Temple Mount before Moshe Dayan ordered it to be taken down and control handed back to the Islamic Waqf. So there is much more to come in terms of restoring Zion. What about the acceleration? Isn't it amazing just to cast our minds back a few years and see the extraordinary rise of anti-Semitism across the world, not just becoming more prevalent, but becoming more and more rapid in the way that it expresses itself. The, the slavering hatred against Jews and Israel. That is going to have the effect of giving an added impetus towards the gathering of scattered Israel. And immigration is going to increase Israel's economic power and her military strength at the same time as putting pressure on land. Those people who are coming into the land will need to go somewhere. There are shifts in the tectonic plates going on that are going to drive Israeli government policy, no matter who is in power. And there are two straws in the wind that have really caught my attention over recent weeks. When Netanyahu was first again prime minister, he made a statement to the effect that you cannot be an occupier in your own territory. That signifies to me that Israel is starting to gird her loins towards exercising full sovereignty in Judea and Samaria. It may not be tomorrow, it may not be next week, but this is the direction of travel. There was also a visit to Temple Mount by the National Security Minister Itamar ben Gvir. Now, he's a very particular character, but nevertheless, there was something behind that which is a straw in the wind. There is a growing sense on the part of many in Israel that they are going to be damned if they do and they da damned if they don't. The world is going to hate them, whatever, so they may as well do what they want to do. They may as well exercise full sovereignty in Judea and Samaria. They may as well reoccupy Temple Mount and start building their third temple. And while those things are going on, we see the continuing challenge of the enemy, the enemy within and the enemy without. Of course, in terms of enemy without, Iran gets closer and closer by the day to having a nuclear capability. In terms of the enemy within, we have seen Hamas and PLO never slacken in their desire to overthrow the Israeli state. But now we're seeing another element of the enemy within through the stirring up of elements within Judaism, within Israeli society itself. And as always, if Satan can't thwart God's plans entirely, he's going to try and make them come about in the wrong way or in the wrong time. There are things happening in the world that are going to cause Jews to make aliyah. Satan doesn't want them to come to Israel. He's going to try and make Israel a place that is, is not somewhere they want to go. This is part and parcel of what is going on. Israel, of course, is a forerunner, as it is in Israel, so it will be in the church. And so we look to see what's going on in our own nation and where God wants to position that nation through his church for what he wants to do at these times. And I'd suggest that if you want to see God's manifesto for Britain, a really good place to start is Isaiah 66, verse 19. Isaiah, of course, is a little bit like the Bible in miniature. 66 books of Isaiah mirror the 66 books of the Bible. 
and they divide in terms of the thrust of their message and their emphasis 39 27 39 chapters which are very much more akin to an old testament message 27 which are more akin to a new testament message and so when you get into isaiah 66 you know you're very deep into the end times isaiah 66 verse 10 tells us about the rebirth of israel can a nation be reborn in a day and it also tells us about the distant islands and says that the distant islands will proclaim god's glory among the nations and those verses are also linked with the coming back of scattered israel as you read through to verse 21. so god has a plan and a purpose for our nation which is not yet finished Romans 11 29 says the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. They're irrevocable for individuals, irrevocable for nations. Our job is to cooperate with God's plans and purposes so that he may work through our nation as he, would, as he wants. In church and nation, in Israel and in Britain, we face the same siren call from the world and the same challenge are we going to stand firm on god's word and promises or not are we going to choose to step into god's intended destiny for us or not that is where we are at the moment an absolutely pivotal time in our national story i suggest that there are four words beginning with s that we could use to describe what is going on at the moment those words are shaking sifting sorting and synchronizing shaking sifting sorting synchronizing in terms of shaking it is a commonplace that god is shaking the nations just look at what we have seen in recent years in our own nation in terms of british institutions the government the parliament the monarchy bbc nhs wherever you look across the political economic social and cultural landscape you see nothing but upheaval and change and a sense that somehow things no longer work the way that they ought to things are no longer fit for purpose things that previously we thought of as being pillars of our society and our constitution that were the beacons of stability and security and leadership every single one of them has been found wanting god is exposing the futility of man's thinking the futility of human systems over and over again and this is a great work of god that he is doing in every nation but we see it loud and clear in our own exposure 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 in society exposure and shaking in the church too and this exposure and shaking has moved to a new level as the church of england has decided to bless homosexual relationships the church of england establishment have tried to handle it the old way the time honored old-fashioned way they've used clever forms of words they've bought, it used what they would no doubt call elegant compromises but this isn't a season any longer in which god will accept compromise with his word or with his truth or with his ways he's exposing our compromise our cowardice our apostasy and there is no clever form of words we can devise that will be able to cover this up the message for us now is we either get with god's program or he's going to find other people to work with that's shaking in terms of sifting the latest census in the uk 
recorded another big fall in the number of people who identify as Christian. So it's mirrored by a continuing fall in the membership of most denominational churches. Some of that trend, by the way, reflects people leaving institutions they see as apostate so that they can form house churches or online fellowships or sometimes just have a time in the wilderness. Nominal believers are falling away and there is a separation taking place between those who take the Bible literally and are true disciples and those who want a quiet life and are happy to adapt to fit modern cultural norms. Now, you might think the analogy is a bit of a stretch, but I would suggest this is a kind of alia for the church. God's shaking the nations, creating turmoil in the nations, so that Jews make alia to Israel. He's creating turmoil in what we have called church for a long time, so that his people also make alia. Question is, where are you going to make Alia to? Are you going to come out of one nation to go to Israel if you're a Jew? Or are you going to go somewhere that you think is more comfortable like the United States? Are we going to come out of one denominational structure to come into what God wants or what we find more congenial? We're in a process at the moment and sometimes when you're in a process, it can be very difficult to see beyond that process. You're just experiencing the buffeting of everyday circumstance. But God always brings us out of one thing with the intention of taking us into something else. He did it when he took Israel out of Egypt. He did it when he took the United Kingdom out of the European Union. And he's doing it now with his ecclesia coming out of what has a form of godliness but denies its power so we need to reflect upon what it is that god's wanting to take us into at this point that's sifting satan wants to sift us like wheat god wants to sift us in a different way entirely which brings us to sorting because god is reconfiguring what we understand by church. And I believe that relational fluidity is replacing the kind of structures and silos and ministries and names that we love to build for ourselves with all our organizations and, and what have you. This is a process that is going to see the denominational boundaries dissolve as the ecclesia comes forth and what happens in the rump of what the world thinks of as church is another matter but within the ecclesia God's wanting to dissolve structures he's wanting to bring us into a place where the only label that will matter is the one of carrying the name of Jesus and there are five aspects to that sorting, I believe. Choice, purpose, opportunity, return, purification. Choice, purpose, opportunity, return, purification. Choice because God is a God of choice. God makes choices and God gives us the ability to choose. We are being given the opportunity to choose relevance or irrelevance, God's way or man's way. One of the scriptures that is something I find very powerful, Judges 5 verse 23, this is the song of Deborah after ba uh, Barak has won the battle against Caesarea and Jabin. And Rather strangely, the scripture says, curse Maros, curse it bitterly, for it did not come to help the Lord, to help the Lord against the mighty. It was a scripture that was used by Puritan preachers immediately before the English Civil War. And the point they wanted to draw out from it is you can't 
sit on the fence. In those days, in this coming battle between king and parliament, you couldn't sit on the fence. But right now, in our own circumstance, we cannot sit on the fence. It is our job to come and help the Lord against the mighty. Hallelujah. Purpose. As I said, God's bringing us out to take us back in. We are going through a painful process at the moment, but it is not pain for no purpose. And we are not moving through a landscape that consists only of threats. There is huge need and there is serious upheaval, but those bring correspondingly great opportunities. And God is looking for a church who will be alert and alive to the opportunity. And when you talk about opportunity, we have not been a shepherd for the nation. Our nation is in dire straits because she has had no church to shepherd her. God, again, wants a church that will shepherd a nation. Return. God wants to reorientate his people. This is a time for God to bring us back to understanding his prophetic timeline, to understanding the significance for our days of the feasts of the Lord, to look for the ancient paths where the good way is and to walk in. And purification. God is in the business of purifying his ecclesia and removing mixture from his church, especially the mixture of Greek thinking. Zechariah 9.13, God tells us, I will rouse your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, because the Greek thinking that dominates Western culture is anti-God. And that thinking must be challenged and confronted. The Hebrew thing understands that the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob is God. And there is no other. And he is central to everything that must come forth. We can't expect the fruit to be good if the root isn't good. We can't expect to build a godly structure on an ungodly foundation. And yet that's those things are what we have been trying to do, what we've been looking for in years past. God saying, no, let's start again. Let's get back to that place where the fruit will be good because the root is good and the building will be holy because the foundations are good. In classical theatre, the, the way that the Greeks understood theatre. They had four what they called unities, the unity of time, place, character and action. Those are spheres in which God deals with us. He deals with us in times of time, in terms of time and place and character and action. The process that he is taking us through at the moment is designed to align us with his purposes across the dimension of time, in other words, what season we're in, across the dimension of place, the particular space that we occupy as individuals and as groups. In terms of character, our increasing conformity to the likeness of Christ, and in terms of action, our manifestation of the kingdom. All of this is to purify his bride and to realign his people, to move us from defense to attack, to put us on a war footing. If we're going to cooperate with what the Lord is doing at this time, we therefore need to reflect upon the extent to which we're in step with God across each of those areas. Have we recognized the changing season that we're in and have we at least started the process of adjusting to it. Are we occupying the place we're intended to occupy? 
Are we supposed to be sharing that place with somebody else? And if so, what does that look like? Or are we in fact in somebody else's place? What's our character like? Are we clothed in heavenly armor by virtue of our character? Do we have that truthfulness, righteousness, faithfulness, the readiness to walk in the gospel, the ability to wield the sword of the spirit, the wearing of the helmet of salvation? And in terms of action, are we doers of the word or hearers only receiving our own self? Are we manifesting the kingdom or only talking about it? I love my country and I want to see my country be everything that she can be for God and in God and through God. And she can only be so if the church of God in this nation arises and manifests the kingdom. May it be so in our day. Hallelujah. Thank you, Philip. That uh, that was amazing. Um, just.